tracheostomy tubes i've used this slide for years and i think it's made its rounds too and you might see it in other people i used to work with lecturers but i we took this picture years ago to show how kind of as a joke how most people have tracheostomy tubes organized in their mind that being it's a big jumbled mess there's lots of tubes and i don't understand them some people don't want to but evidently you do because you're listening to this but I want you to think of this as there's a wide variety and that means we have many options. And getting familiar with all of the variety of tubes and options, as I said before, can make us such an important resource for the other people and other disciplines that we work for and perhaps even the ear, nose, and throat doctors. And I still get calls to this day just to talk about what might be the best tube for a particular patient, what the symptoms are, the problems are. And I think that it's been improving over the years and the physicians are kind of troubleshooting a little bit more, but sometimes it's just nice to talk to somebody who might be up to date on the topic, might have a few more options, or just help confirm what they're thinking. And sometimes I will suggest a tube that perhaps the physician has never heard of, and talking tubes in particular. So there's a wide variety, and that's pretty much the purpose of this lecture. It's important to know that the numbering systems, the sizing systems are not equivalent. I'll review that. Length is important. Laryngectomy tubes are very short and I have found laryngectomy tubes in tracheostomy patients and that can result in a possible unexpected decannulation. And for ventilator patients in particular, the tube is used to deliver air to the lungs. And so it needs to be deep enough into the trachea so that it can do that. And speaking of deep enough into the trachea, we have to ensure that the tube is inside of the trachea. And I will talk about that a little bit, how possibly we can make sure that that is the case. Should the cuff be inflated or not? This depends. And I will be going over when the cuff is inflated, how the cuff is inflated. I can tell you now that because there's a cuff on a tracheostomy tube, that doesn't mean that it has to be inflated. And this use of the word hard, how hard should the cuff be inflated? I'll be showing you the pilot balloon that is an indication of the air in the cuff, but they're palpating or pressing on the outer pilot balloon doesn't tell you anything about cuff inflation. And this is a practice that should be avoided and there's research on the topic. And I'm sure I'll be talking about that more. So when you see two lines on the trach tube, that's a talking trach. Let me show you how they work. So I've been talking a lot about the cuff and why it should be deflated and why it needs to be deflated for speaking valves, which I will go over shortly. But it can't always be deflated. And there are definitely those times when a patient, let's say end stage COPD, cannot get enough air into the lungs. They're stiff lungs. They need that cuff so they can have higher pressures. It won't be deflated. And I have had patients with severe intractable aspiration where you can't deflate the cuff for any meaningful period to enable phonation, so the cuff must remain inflated. Talking trachs are really the answer to allow patients to phonate while the cuff is still inflated. There are several options. Portex has some, Bavona, and there's the Blom trach system. 
So the difference between using the Bovona and Portex talking trach versus a speaking valve is not just that the cuff remains inflated with the talking trach, but the patient is actually talking on an external air source. With a speaking valve, they're using their own pulmonary air, but that isn't possible with the cuff up. So let me show you how these work. Next case study, we have a 28-year-old female who's in a car accident. She's trached pegged. She's had it for one month, and go figure, she has that size 8 cuff shyly as well. Her vent settings are tidal volume of 550 cc's, which is depending on the vent in the facility, cc's and those milliliters are used interchangeably. Respiratory rate of 10, PEEP of 5, pressure support 10, and she's not on any oxygen. Deflate the trait cuff, and the tidal volume is 475, and there's a poor cough, which that 475 is not a big drop if we're going to be leaking. Poor cough and no voicing. We're not able to hear any voice at all. Would you place a valve? No, I wouldn't, because she doesn't have that big drop in that tidal volume, and you're not able to hear any voicing. That's telling us that her trach's too big. She needs a size six. And then also think about, is the cuff needed? We see far too much that in especially acute care that these people have these trach cuffs for such a long time and will say why and it's so to help with their secretions or help keep their pressures or volumes up. That's okay in the very early acute illness stages, but once some issues have resolved, it's time to get them a cuffless cuffless trach. So we're pretty quick where I am about getting them a cuffless immediately. And that is standard of care for, uh, for a long-term quad or trach patient, actually. So now they have a size six and they're able to talk and make sounds. Would you place the valve now? And the answer was yes, we would.